Funding for the production of Public Square is provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, working to improve the lives of vulnerable children. This program is the result of a partnership with Mission Graduate and funded locally by United Way of Central New Mexico and... This program is part of American Graduate. Let's make it happen a public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Success in school, indeed in life, starts with showing up. But boosting attendance rate isn't easy. Making that happen is the subject of our Rural Education Town Hall today. Every day matters. I'm Sarah Gustavus from New Mexico PBS. Welcome to this town hall gathering, part of American Graduate, Let's Make It Happen. We're joined today by Tony Monfaletto, the director of the New Mexico Center for School Leadership, Richard Luarki, former governor of Laguna Pueblo and a longtime education leader in his tribe, and Audie Brown, superintendent of the Estancia School District. In the audience are parents, students, educators, and community stakeholders, all ready to offer their views on how to tackle chronic absence. And you can be a part of the conversation online, on the New Mexico PBS website and on Twitter. The graduation rate nationally is 80%, but in New Mexico, our rate is about 70%, and it's even lower in rural areas, about 58%. Why do students drop out? It could be poverty. Some need to go to work to help support their families and themselves. Parents or other family members who didn't complete high school or had bad experiences themselves may not be supportive. Some students experience bullying, and New Mexico has one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the nation. Those can all add up to poor attendance. Federal law requires each state define and report on truancy. Chronic absence is missing an extended amount of school for any reason and includes both excused and unexcused absences. Missing just two days a month means 10% of an academic year. Students who don't show up for class don't learn. And it's not just reading, writing, and math that they're missing. It's life skills and relationships that will help them succeed in the future. The problems can start at a very young age. Missing just two days of kindergarten each month means students are less likely to be proficient readers by third grade. By ninth grade, attendance records are one of the strongest predictors of graduation. Let's turn to our panelists to get this discussion started about chronic absence. Tony Monfaletto, start us off. What are some things that you think would be effective in addressing this issue here in New Mexico in about a minute or less, big picture? We have uh, started a network of schools that are all aimed at young people that have dropped out or are off track to graduation. So essentially the community of kids that um, are disengaged from school. And what we found is that a, a model that emphasizes community engagement for the students, learning by doing, so an active um, participation in the learning as opposed to receiving learning from a, directly from a teacher, and then support structures for young people and families. That when those three things come together, uh, the impact is greater on students and the attendance rate increases and the amount of learning increases. Richard Lorkey, what about you? Can you speak to the needs of our native students in New Mexico? Well, you know, I, I think as it relates to native students and, and the dropout rate, one of the important things is the articulation of data. We don't do a good job of articulating data. So when you look at schools like Laguna Acoma, Santa Fe, Indian, Naka, you have practically a 100% graduation rate. But the cohort of that class, say a freshman class that comes in, and, and, a, and a kid maybe junior year, pulls out from, say, Santa Fe Indian and goes to uh, one of the schools in APS. Well, if they're not tracked, then it's, it's captured as a dropout. And so I think that's a very important piece to be able to articulate. I think it's important to understand the underlying factors and, and the other underlying currents that are contributing to that and how we interpret dropout rates. Adi Brown, your thoughts? Well, in Estancia, our, according to state data, the attendance rate is not uh, overly um, negative. There are definite areas that we can improve upon, and we're looking internally as to how we can address them, such as uh, late night athletic events, activities. Um, but even more so, the biggest challenge is, while we're doing okay as far as the excused attendance rate, the unexcused, I should say, 
the excused attendance rate is the concern. We have folks that believe that simply because they are excused, that that is a good enough reason for them not to have to um, be in school. And that is the challenge that we're currently facing. The attendance rate, the excused attendance rate, is something that, that we really need to look at. Simply because a child are, is excused and for a variety of reasons, they're still not in school. And that is the direct challenge that we've got to, to address. Those are some great points to get us started. We definitely want to also hear from students. They're an important part of this conversation. And they're, they're at the heart of this crisis in attendance. We visited four schools in central New Mexico to talk to students and get an understanding of the roadblocks they face. With the help of two New Mexico nonprofits, Learning Alliance and Little Globe, we went to Bernalillo High School, Estancia High School, Los Lunas High School, and the School of Dreams Academy in Los Lunas. Let's start with what students said engages them and what makes the, what they think their fellow students would need to want to come to school and have good attendance. Make our students really enjoy coming to school instead of just, oh, I gotta go to school. Make it a, a good thing to come to school. More clubs, more programs to be involved in, more mm, teachers to realize what students' dreams are and how they affect their lives and how the teachers impact a, a student's life. I would definitely throw in some sports at this school and some extracurricular activities just because I feel like um, kids that go here would, would I guess, like enjoy it more if there was extracurricular activities and like sports at the school and stuff. And I also feel that if we do, did have sports here, then our, our, ki our kids that go here, their grades would be much better. You have to have like good grades and stuff to be able to join the sport. And I think if kids want to join the sport enough, then they would keep their grades up. To improve the school system, I would talk to like each individual student and find out what they want to do when they're older, and then try to like involve that into their school learning now. Uh, like they should start like showing like tenth and up how to like prepare for the real world, like paying bills, taxes, and stuff like that. So that way, like, we know how to do it instead of, like, just getting hit right there before college, becoming, getting all that stuff, that pressure, and not even know how to do it. But now, like, if they teach it, we know how to get somewhat of it done. So I want to hear from our audience now. What do you think engages students, really makes them want to show up for school every day? Especially from our students, I want to hear from you. Is there one thing that makes you want to come to school? I think personal connections both, between both students and teachers really makes students want to come to school. If you don't have that strong personal connection between both your teachers and your peers, why would you want to come? You don't feel comfortable being there. You're like, I don't know any of these people. I'm so uncomfortable here. I'm surrounded by strangers. I don't want to go. I know we have some teachers in the audience. How do you build relationships with students and make them feel welcomed and invited? One of the things I've done in the past is I, I do try to get to know the students and a little bit about them and like they said, get to know uh, some of what they want to do. Um, I'm involved in extracurricular, I get them involved in that and just kind of have fun with it and enjoy and you can joke around and learn at the same time. And like they said, um, I learned a long time ago, back like 29 years ago, the kids don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. So you do need to care, you need to feel connection like she said. Audie Brown, I want to hear from you. Are sports a, an effective way to make students feel engaged in the classroom? Sometimes you hear people saying sports are a distraction. That's, that's a very interesting question. It, it can, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It definitely can be a motivating factor for students to want to attend school. Uh, it can also be one that, um, as I mentioned it in, during the opening statement, can be a challenge for students whenever they are at an away activity and then by the time they get in, it is uh, very late in the evening or early in the morning, and they have to get up early and, and go to school. So it, it can be definitely from the students that I have talked to, it is definitely more of a motivator and a reason to come to school as opposed to the opposite. So any of the schools that you've started, do they have sports? We do. Um, I might like to just talk about this from a personal experience. So I, I was a high school athlete, and not a great high school athlete, but I was, I was a ha high school athlete. And um, the beauty of sports is that there's a game. You know, you practice, and you get ready for a game. There's real life at the end. Friday night, you know, you're playing, and there's something at stake, and you practiced for a purpose because there was a game at the end of the week. And I think a lot of the problem with school is 
that you're practicing, but there's no game, there's no event that you're getting ready for. You know, there may be a standardized test at the end, but is that really something that you would go to school for every day and dig into and work at to be ready to perform for? I think the theater example is a perfect example. Like, you audition, you practice, and there's a, there's a show. And it's all on the line, and you really want to be ready for the show. And I think that school could be much more like that than what it is now, which is a lot of practice, but nothing at the end of the practice. Activities certainly aren't limited to sports. What about arts, theater, dance, any other band, any other kinds of activities? Any students involved in those at your school? I'm involved in a Native American uh, Youth Council, and I think that helps me a lot because I do want to stay in that, but to do so, I have to keep my grades up. So I feel that that's a good point, too. What do you do in that council? I am the uh, public representative, so whenever um, events, I'm there saying what we do. There's a um, middle school tours of our high school. I'm there telling the students, you know, what you have to do to become a part of this group, what you have to do to keep that role. Now, is your group uh, talking about Native culture, sharing some of your um, things from your own tribe with your family? Yes, we do do that. and. Um, but we mostly try to get the whole, the whole school involved in those events as well. Richard Lewarki, what about that? Hearing a young young Native person being involved in that in their school, is that an, do you think that's an effective way for students to have some pride in their culture and also be involved in, in school, helping fellow students learn? You know, and it's it's wonderful hearing what he said as well as the the other student um, in their comments. Um, uh, you know, like Tony, a little bit of personal experience as well in that uh, I got to college on a football scholarship, but I couldn't get there if my grades were not in check. And so a big, a big motivator for that was my, grandma, my grandmother raised me. So we didn't have the resources to pay for a college education, so I knew there, was ha there had to be another source. But her as a motivator as well, I remember when I was in college, I might not have done well in a test. I got home thinking I'm gonna be able to stay home but I never got the, 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 the sense of, you're gonna stay here forever. The question I got back was, when are you going back? Mm -hmm. And so I think to what he's talking about, the ability to participate in those types of organizations, whether it's athletics, whether it's band, whether it's student council, whether it, whatever it is, it brings the opportunity to engage with others. It brings the opportunity to um, deepen, broaden, and, and, and elevate your own intellect. Because in my mind, it's not a thing, uh, it's not a race issue. It's not about Native American, Hispanic, Black, Asian, whatever. We're all blessed with talent, with intellect. And we all have to recognize and acknowledge and appreciate that in one another. And, and, and so I think teachers have a, a gift to pull that out of our young people. What about challenges? And we can say that this is great to do sports or to do art or to do all these activities, but we all know that you still have to study. You still have core things that you have to learn. You have to do testing. Do you feel a challenge? Do you feel like you don't really have enough time to do all of these things? Yeah, I do feel like we have challenges because there's sometimes during tribal activities, I come home from school, I um, come home from um, our uh, village and um, get my backpack out. I have to do homework. It can be about 10 o'clock and I have to study for a test. That's tomorrow. Take me about a couple hours. Time I go to bed, it's like one o'clock. I get up next morning tired for the test. Worried if I passed it or not. Sometimes I don't, sometimes I do. And Mark, do your teachers help you? Are you working with your teachers to say, maybe I need an extension, maybe I need a little bit of extra time since I have this other obligation? Yes, I do. Um, over spring break, actually, I, um, I had a tribe obligations and um, we had an essay due in my English class. And I told them, you know, I, have, I had stuff to do over the spring break and I hope you understand. And he said, yeah, that was fine. You can turn it in uh, next week. So, yeah. Is the lesson asking early? <laughs> in advance? Yes. Instead of after it's due? Yeah. Any other students? You know, there's lots of obligations that you probably have. You may work, you may need to help take care of younger brothers and sisters. Any other challenges that, that keep you from engaging as much as you might want to at school? Since I come from Three Pueblo, San Felipe, Isleta, and San Adafonso, there are different obligations within different Pueblos. 
and it's going to be hard during, like you said, during spring break. We have all, all those obligations. We have those dances. And since I'm a big person who likes to participate, I have homework to do during the middle of those dances when we have breaks. Oh, I got to go do my homework. I got to go run to my grandma's house, write it down, come back to the village, and then go participate again. And then when I have another break, go back to my grandma's house and write another sentence or two, depending on what's happening. And it, it's a big hassle because us as Native Americans, we have different issues within our pueblos also, not within our tribal land, but with outskirts within schools, work. And it's hard because I come from other pueblos. I got to drive my mom and my dad had to drive me to San Ildefonso just to participate. And we got to rely on my grandpa or my auntie just to drive me back home. But then again, it's always asking early to the teachers, can you assign me this essay or this work a week before so I can get it done so I have that time. Adam in the video also mentioned that it would be great if classes talked about more real world things that, that you all know that you actually need to do, paying bills, preparing for a job, preparing for things that will happen after school. What do you think about that? Do you think that lessons tied into real life would make your classes more interesting? I have a class that deals with personal finance and teaches you how to care, take care of a bank account and I found it very enlightening because it really helped because you take care of a fake person's account and you have to balance and make sure everything works but I, th I thought it was a very good class because I didn't know what I was doing when it first started so. What about our panel? What do you think about that idea of maybe what we're using, the examples that we're using in the classroom, tying them back into the things that students need to know for testing, tying it back into those, those core curriculum but, but giving them something that they can relate to? I can tell you when I was a classroom teacher myself that was one area that I truly focused on. Not only did I help them understand how to balance a checkbook and um, add deposits and, and take away withdrawals, but I also went into detail about future possibilities as far as different professions, whether doctor, teacher, lawyer, um, plumber, various uh, occupations, and the salaries that were associated therewith. And then we brought in how much it would be to pay a mortgage, electricity, gas, a new vehicle, gas for that vehicle, insurance, and the list goes on. And the students told me time and time again that that is what they just uh, found incredibly valuable. I can tell you as a superintendent, it is, it is uh, somewhat frustrating that we don't have as much time nowadays to be able to do that. And I think that that is kind of the, the block, uh, creating a block that is creating some of the disengagement between staff and students is the fact that we have so much testing that is taking place in our classrooms. Um, while there, it's true there aren't so many uh, tests from the state, there are end of year exams, there is the now park assessment, we've got the two park assessments even though there's a discussion to, to make it one, we've got end of course um, assessments, end of chapter assessments, assessment, assessment, assessment. And so it's, it's tough on the children to be able to get fully engaged as a result thereof. Richard, do you want to pick up on that a little more? You mentioned earlier having students feel their intellect and what they can bring and what they can learn and, and is connecting that to a career or to a future after school an important part of this conversation? Absolutely. You know, um, on the uh, yahoo.com website, maybe some of you might have seen the, on the news article uh, or news section of the website, they were um, showcasing a teacher in Colorado who was trying to learn her students a little better, third graders. So she asked them to answer the, uh, answer the, the, the question, you know, I wish my teacher knew. And so, and mind you, third graders. So as an example, some of the responses were, I wish my, my teacher knew I have no pencils at home to do my homework. I wish my teacher knew I miss my dad because he got deported six years ago and have not seen him in six years. By the same token, it also said, I wish my teacher knew I want to go to college. And so it would be interesting to be able to pose that same question but replace teacher with parent. I wish my parent knew that I need to know these things. So I want to give you just a moment. Do you want to close out this conversation about engagement, maybe follow up on some yeah, of Yeah, um, I think that one of the problems that we have in school is that we think of school as preparation for life 
instead of thinking about school is life. I mean, you guys are living and you're in school and school could be much more important in a daily way to the lives of the young people that we serve. The community is full of rich problems that if we engage young people in helping us solve those problems, um, there'd be a, uh, an incredible amount of opportunity for you to feel like what I do today matters. It is my life now. It's not a preparation for later in life. And we've got tons of examples of young people engaging in the community to solve real problems and feeling a real sense of value from being a, a problem solver for their own community. Great point. We'll get to some more of that in a little bit. We'd like to move on, though, to transportation. That is an issue specific to rural New Mexico that we want to talk about. Getting to school isn't always easy. Rural areas have few public transportation options and long distances to travel. Some districts don't have buses for students. Poor districts are more likely to have transportation challenges than rich ones. We know that's an issue here for many districts in New Mexico. And small districts have less to spend on transportation. So how big of a barrier is transportation and what can be done about it? Let's listen to what some students told us. My dad works in Albuquerque and my mom works nights in Albuquerque. And since school starts at eight, I'm not always able to get here on time. So my mom will get back late and she'll just have to take us to school right away. And so I, it can be a challenge to get to and from school. And there are also days where it's like during testing I wasn't sure if my dad would come to pick my brother and I up, and it was kind of upsetting. Uh, it's a little hard. It depends on the weather. I live in Adelino. I live literally on a farm, so we have tractors sliding off the roads if we're not careful. <laughs> we don't have paved roads where I, exactly where I live. We have to go down this really long dirt road. So you gotta be careful sometimes because back end of your car will start to slide forward. <laughs> the tractor got stuck and they tried to get it out with another tractor and that tractor got stuck. And that was one of the biggest tractors we had. So no one could have gone anywhere. <laughs> if we wanted to, we had to go straight through a field. <laughs> it's hard because I have to wake up at 4.30 in the morning. I have a two hour bus ride. We have a really long bus route and we have to go up and down different dirt roads and usually around 545, 550. Just depends on on the weather and on who we have to pick up because each morning everybody has to call the bus driver. Hard to keep focused during school and because I'm always so tired. I would say transportation could be a problem, you know, because um, not everyone could get a ride here. Some kids have to walk and we don't have school buses. So I think if we had buses, it would be a lot better. What about uh, our community members who are here in the room with us? What do you know students are facing and how is it impacting them if they have to drive a long distance? Like Shaylin said, that she has an incredibly long day. We think of as adults, you know, how long our commutes can be, how challenging that can be to take care of everything we need to take care of when we get home. It's a real challenge for students who still need to read or study or meet other obligations once they're done for the day. I run an after-school program at Bernalillo High School. And I wish my program could last a little longer because most of the kids, that, most of the students that come into the clubhouse don't have access to computers at home. So I'm the only place they have for a computer after school. And many of them come in to do homework after school. So uh, our bus, the latest bus they can catch is at five o'clock. Uh, and some of them have a 45 minute ride at that point but it'd be nice if the bus ran a little bit longer. So they face the issue of not being able to use the appropriate equipment uh, for more than an hour and a half or two hours a day. Does that mean they're not finishing their work? Some of them time? don't finish their work, they have to come the next day, but we, this, uh, the past few months we've been working a lot on senior thesis issues and things like that. And it's just very difficult for them to finish that work then because when they go home, there's no computer, there's no printer, there's nothing at the, at the Pueblo to complete that task. Let's go to our panelists. What are you hearing in your communities that young people are facing when it comes to getting to and from school and the impact that that's having on them in the classroom? Tony, you want to start? Well, our schools are in Albuquerque, but transportation's still a challenge. Um, if you're going to have a school choice program in a community, it's uh, the choice is only as valid as your ability to exercise it. So if you can't go to the school you want to go to and you have to get across town and there's no school bus to do it, um, it's just 
it's a significant challenge. But is there a way that schools could systemically look at that and say this is an issue, we need to make these accommodations to really meet the needs of our students? Well, I can't speak to the rural situation, but I know in, in Albuquerque, just the simple giving young people bus passes so they can get to school without having, because the traditional system doesn't serve their neighborhood and to get them across town, I think is a simple, straightforward um, kind of solution. The challenge that we face is a shortage of bus drivers. And that is probably the, the biggest uh, issue that we face on a yearly basis. And it is, we have, in Estancia, we are currently the, we pay the most f to our bus drivers for the to and from component. And we still have a, a very, very difficult time recruiting and, and even retaining some of our bus drivers. Do you know why that is? Uh, I wish that I knew. We have tried and tried to talk to these folks and we even pay for the training. We pay for the actual licensing. We're doing everything we possibly can to attract and again retain these bus drivers and it is still an incredible challenge to be able to find these people willing to do so. And we're going to move on now to um, revisit something that's already come up a little bit. Parents, teachers, and administrators can be enormously helpful in getting kids to come to school. We want to talk a little bit more about the significance of ha a student having a caring adult, maybe a teacher, as some students mentioned earlier, to offer consistent advice and help. Again, let's hear from some students from the high schools. The adults in my life actually do support me because I mean, of course, they send me to school each day. And even with tribal activities going on the day before, they still tell me, all right, go to bed early. We can get home at like 1 o'clock in the morning. All right, you're going to school tomorrow morning. Go to sleep. And it's like, I can't get a break. It's hard. It's hard sometimes. But um, I think they do a really good job trying to get me to be active in school, as in joining clubs, extracurricular activities, and also in school in general, because they don't want, I know they don't want to see me fail. I'm only with my mom at the moment, so I kind of wish that she would be more concerned about my education right now. She's always gone and she's never asking me how things are, and that kind of makes me feel lonely, like she's not caring if I'm doing well or not. I feel like if she would just take the time to sit down and talk to me on occasion, I would feel happier, I wouldn't be like having all of these emotions inside me just bottling up and then when I finally do tell her it all explodes out and we get in a huge fight and then things just end up worse. I'd like to start with our panel on this one. We know that it's not just about the students, it's also about the families. Some of our families in New Mexico, parents are working one job, two jobs, three jobs. They're so busy. Is there a way that you think parents can, can make be a little more effective in reaching out to their students to support them, maybe something, something easy, something that they could do consistently? The pathway to learning is through support. That you can't learn unless you feel safe. You can't take intellectual risks and be vulnerable at school or any place else unless you feel safe. And so the, I really believe the pathway to learning is through support. And what we need are schools that are safer cultures, school culture that's safer, more accommodating to young people. And I also believe that there's some um, very good research out there about family and the connection to young people that if parents share the trials of their own lives with their children and young people understand that life is a trial at times and that their parents are resilient and they came through and they are where they are because of their life's journey, that young people are more resilient for knowing that. And so when you know your own family history, you know your tribal history, um, you know your family history, you are more, that makes you more resilient. And so I think it is school cultures getting safer and I think it's families being able to share um, their own experiences with their children. Out of your teachers, maybe if, if a parent's incredibly busy and they, they don't have time to sit down with a student, do teachers and staff have the time to do that? Again, that's a major challenge that we face. I do know that we have some teachers that make the time and we applaud their efforts consistently and continually. And that's what's so exciting to, to be an administrator and watch that in action. Because those children, those students, they will do everything in their power to get into that teacher's classroom at all costs. And that is, is so 
enlightening and heartening for us as administration. By the same token, we have some staff members, just like in any profession, that need a little guidance, a little push to, to open their minds and open the doors a little bit more to accepting and being more engaging with the students and get away from the, the papers that are yellow and cracked and they're, they're brittle because they've been using it for 25 years. We need to find a way to get those teachers to become more into the modern world and times and be open to um, listening to the students and seeing what it is that they feel is important in their lives, what they're going to need for the future, and that is, of course, technology. I remember one, at one point reading some of our older council minutes from older council meetings, and, and this one was from the late 1960s. And, and the council minutes talked about, um, in, our, in our Pueblo, the, the community members uh, have the opportunity to submit when there's what we call needs and concerns of, of the village members. If there's issues they want the council to be aware of and address. One of those concerns in the late 60s was from the community, from the parents, was that the buses are coming too early now. Therefore, the kids are missing the bus. Council, you need to do something about that. The council's response to the community was, get your kids up earlier. It was from a, a change in time from 7, 7.10 to 7 a.m. Now, when you look at that same situation in this modern day and age, what would have been the different response? The council might have said, let's go call the school, as opposed to saying, that's a parental responsibility. I'd like to go to the audience now. <clears throat> Tell us who has been that caring adult who is there for you, who is able to provide you with support, encouragement, and um, what did that mean to you? Mine would be my 11th grade teacher, which was last year, Mr. Jaramillo. And uh, he actually gave me a nickname because I always wanted to go to Stanford College. So now he calls me, hey, Stanford, hey, Stanford, what are you doing, Stanford? And so that was his nickname for me. And every day, even until now, he'll be like, how's your grades? You ready for Stanford? You ready? And even with that, with what uh, one of the panelists said, that uh, the councilman, I remember right was I was in middle school, class would start at 8. Now classes start at 726. That huge change of time. It kind of messes the days up now. You know how we used to have class end like at four or three. Now class ends at 226. And it kind of messes up my kind of days and I got to do my work. And my, when I go home, my parents are like, do you have work? Do you have work to do? Can I help you on your work? I'm like, no or yes. And we'll sit down at the table and they'll try to help me. And then again, they're like, wow, I, never, I haven't seen this kind of work since I was in high school. And that's been like, how many years ago? I don't really know how to do this anymore. Let me see your notes and I'll show my notes. I'm sorry, I can't really help you on this. It's been so long. Maybe if I took one lesson on this, maybe I could help you. But then again, it's always depending on what your parents can help you with and what they can do to support you. And because me, as Native Americans, we believe in family, and always family comes first. So when you go to a family gathering, they always ask you, are your grades okay? Do you need help on this area? How can the family help you? And we always talk about that, and we had that recently with the family, with me trying to go to these two uh, camps this summer, with college camps, to Stanford and Princeton. And the family said, well, how can we help you out with this? What can we do? And with that, we had a raffle, and it's still ongoing with the raffle. And it's just the huge support from the family is what benefits that one individual as me, such as myself. I actually have two people in life that have actually supported me, is my, my mother and my older sister. My mother is telling us to do good now so we can be good in the future in our life while our sister is telling us to do my older sister is telling us to uh is trying to show us how to do it and how to get to the big jump into the good life and get to college and um right now they are showing me how to get through high school easy enough so i can get a job and a nice home and go to a nice college so i can start my own career and I'm going to hear from some folks in the audience and in the, in the further back rows. Anyone have a story they'd like to share about how a caring, consistent adult really helped you achieve your own goals in school? Back when I was in high school, just a few years ago, my French teacher was really inspiring to me. And it was really important because my family didn't get how important French was and how exciting it was to me. So she was this really great figure. I could always go to her. And for years, we were still friends today. And so her strength supported me in being different and being a little bit unique. And how that's translated today is to a program at Highland High School that I'm created called Adopt a Freshie. Because the reality in schools today, Highland High School, we have 1,400 students. We have 100 teachers. 
So our reality is it's impossible for every student to be connected with a teacher. I mean, that's just impossible. So to address this issue and the idea that every single student we have is amazing and has a story to share that will change the life of someone else, all of them, is I've created this program where every single freshman is being linked up with two to three upperclassmen. And they are going to serve as a mentor, as this team, so we can help connect our freshmen to help graduation rates. Um, and we need to do something different and innovative that's never been done before. And we need different programs that are connecting kids that are outside of sports, the kids that don't fit in, and treat all of our kids as leaders. So with this Adopt a Freshie program, we're real excited to see what happens as we're experimenting, literally connecting all of our kids. And it's this huge goal, and it's making a difference. Already the kids that are starting to connect are really engaging in different ways, and they're like, wow, I can do this. Why well, I have a story. I said, you're really shy, no, but someone needs your story. When my mother um, was nurturing me through school, she didn't feel welcome um, until someone said to her, come and help us with some vaccinations. We need parents to stand in line and to help move um, kids through the vaccination line. That was the first days of polio vaccinations. Um, since then, um, a group known as the National PTA um, has really wrapped their arms around how are the different ways to involve parents in the schools. And uh, the first thing that they do and what the New Mexico PTA is doing today um, is listening to parents. What are your needs? Um, what's getting in the way of helping you get your child to school every day because every day matters? And we're hearing from parents that sometimes it's um, a barrier of transportation. And so we're um, finding that connections to the business community can help us put some dollars on the table to provide gas carts for parents. Um, the parents are telling us, um, we, don't, we wish we could have docs and dentists provide their um, time slots after school hours so our kids can stay in school all day. And so we're working with health care providers to try to get the message out. Um, it, it's time to make your hours more flexible for children who are in school because every day matters. And there's so many uh, ways that it, we begin to listen to parents, just like we're listening to the voices of students today, that we can think of new ways to incentivize attendance and break down those barriers. Absolutely, those are some interesting community-oriented solutions. It's not just about the, the students and teachers. Anyone else want to share a, a solution? I'm a retired educator. I retired after 36 years in the business. And I'm now working with the Interfaith Coalition for Public, Transfer, uh, Public Education in Santa Fe. We are a total volunteer organization and uh, we work with the Chamber of Commerce in Santa Fe around issues like truancy to make truancy actually a community issue. It's not a school issue. In my mind, it's more a community issue. The other thing we are working to also with the Chamber of Commerce and also the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is encouraging employers to give parents time off if there are school issues of their children to be resolved because when I was a principal I know that sometimes it was very difficult for the parents to actually come to school because the question was do I lose income or do I go to school. I have a really fortunate perspective being a community member who's uh, transitioned from solely community member to uh, a community member who's been able to go into uh, schools and actually work with kids. And I think, you know, the importance of having just any adult uh, there to listen to, to, to the kids, you know, fears, hopes, dreams, anything just having a caring adult there just to listen is so important and even if there's caring parents or caring teachers in their lives uh, for some of these kids there's a natural sort of uh, i want to say authoritative divide between them and their teachers or them and their parents so that's where i feel fortunate as a community member who some of them look at me as maybe just an older friend to, to, to tell me things and to, to bounce things off of me. Uh, I think that's where uh, the community can come and fit in. So I don't want the community members out there to underestimate uh, their role um, in helping uh, students and helping them and really enjoy school and enjoy going to school.
We can keep talking about that. That's great hearing uh, how community members can be a part of this. Let's hear from some students talking about their dreams and what, what their, their vision is for their future. As we said, showing up can mean success. Students do get that. They understand the consequences of not graduating. And many of them told us that. They told us also about their dreams. Let's take a listen. Like, I have to come to school. Like, I want to get a good education. I want to graduate high school and do my, get my little life together after high school. My mom, like, after, my mom passed away, so I have to, I feel like I should do better for her, because, like, I know she's watching down on me, so, like, I'm going to do better for her. Like, I'm not going to mess it up for myself. Like, I already messed up last year, and I realized that this year and next year is going to be harder for me, so I'm going to have to do better for myself and my family. When I do decide to go to school, it's because, you know, not only do I just want to learn new things, but, you know, high school is a gateway to college, which is a gateway to the rest of your life. And for me, I want to go to college to get like a nice, well-paid job so I can be successful in my life. I get up because I want a better life than my mom and brother. They didn't gra graduate and it's hard on them and I see how hard it is so I don't want to be like that. My mom from a young age has always taught us that, you know, we need to get an education, you know, and I have dreams in my future, you know, I want to become a behavioral analyst and I know that if I do not finish school and I don't get a high school diploma, that that dream is just going to be crushed. Well, those students talked about their, their dreams and how having someone there telling them that they could do it, they could achieve their dreams, that's so important. Anyone want to share a comment on that or how a caring, consistent adult can help a child see that those dreams are attainable for them? It was surprising to me the last couple of years to have students come in and tell me that they were terrified to graduate. They were, they were going to graduate, but they were terrified because they don't know what they're going to do after. And, and I feel that this is part of our responsibility as adults. And, and I, I see in schools, and, and teachers have huge jobs. They, you know, they can't take a lot of time to do this. But when these kids don't understand that behavioral analysis, that's, that's what that young lady wants to be, a behavioral analysis. When these guys uh, fully understand that if they want to be an artist, there are 200 kinds of artists they can be, not just one. It's not just that they can go be a painter. They can be 200 different things in that, in that career field. And these young people don't understand how many jobs are out there. And part of that support and part of that encouragement is that we can encourage them to be many things, not just the one or two things they think they have to be that we tell them about. When they talk about being musicians, you know, I can't tell you how much screamo and hip hop I've listened to. How many of you have listened? How many of you know what screamo is? Okay, <laughs> I, I know you guys do. <laughs> I know that. Okay, but listen to a little screamo and understand that that that's their dream. They're thinking about being a, a guy who's screaming on a microphone. That's their music, just like we listened to the Beatles, and that's what we wanted to be. So if we can't identify with their dreams, if we can't tell them there are 3,000 things they can do out there, then they don't have a dream. And many of them are terrified to graduate because they don't know what they're going to do with what we've been plowing into their brains for 12 years. I think, Sky, you had your hand up as well? Yeah. I feel like the emphasis on graduating in a tr very traditional fashion in a full day of school um, is a little um, unrealistic for some people, especially if there's learning disabilities or mental illness or um, just a lot of personal factors and that there's not enough support for that. Also, if they just can't see you. Um, I was an honor roll student and I dropped out between eighth and ninth grade and everybody was like shocked, but I had severely been bullied, I had been abused as a kid, and I got pregnant. That, that was the big thing. And I could not, I was terrified. I did not want to go to high school. I was sick every morning thinking about how much they were going to beat me up. Um, but I got my GED as soon as I was legally allowed to in New Mexico at 17, and I started college a year and a half before my cohort, and I got a bachelor's and two masters. And like that, it's not a big deal, but I just mean that. Um, you know, you can be successful, but nobody supported me. Everybody told me like, oh, you're going to be on welfare, you're going to be a bad mom. So that, 
I just wish that more people had support to find alternatives if that environment is just not going to work for you. Like, help me find a different environment instead of um, writing me off or, you know, the next person. Because we can be successful. And Sky, what was it, though, that made you, if, if you weren't getting support, what made you feel like you could accomplish those things? I don't know. I was, uh, I really wanted to be a good parent. And my daughter is up there with blue hair. Um, and uh, I, I was so angry at the reaction of everyone around me um, that I kind of had the like, well, I'm going to show you. Like, how dare you kick me out of the church and, you know, I don't know, just like um, all the negative reactions I got. Uh, so I think that really set up a level of determination and then the uh, like, okay, well, I mean, you have to be a parent now, so what do you do? And you do absolutely anything you can. Along with having a supportive adult to help you, I think it's also just impact, as impactive if you have an adult figure tell you something negative. And this is a personal experience. Last year, I went through a lot of problems with my credits. I came from a different state, and my credits didn't transfer, so I had absolutely no credits for my sophomore year. And at the school I was previously going to, the school system there was impossible for me. I didn't have a computer at home, and I couldn't stay after school because the area it was in was not exactly the safest place. And I was desperately trying to get help from my teachers, and I was begging them, saying, can you do something? Do you have an alternative for me? I cannot do your work online. I can't do it. Can you please do something? And towards the end of the year, still begging my teachers, one of them told me straight to my face, no matter what you do, you're never going to graduate. And this still makes me want to cry. It was probably the worst thing anyone had ever told me. And now, in my senior year, I'm so happy because I have a college acceptance as well as a scholarship. And it's like, yes, in your face. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to share how, how we can encourage young people to see, them, see their dreams and, and realize them? We have someone in the back who hasn't spoken yet. I work with at-risk youth, and I find out what they're interested in, and I've been bringing them to Albuquerque to show them c and um, well, We've been to the place that does model, modeling and acting, and I have a little gal right now who's interested in doing TV makeup, and I've been watching this gal run around, so I'm going to get her number before I leave here. <laughs> because she's fun and um, she, you know, she's neat and I think this girl needs to be exposed to somebody like that. And, uh, but it's just trying to expose them to somebody who's really actually doing it that can really show them and talk to them about it and, and pique that interest in hopes that they'll stay in school and graduate and move on. Anyone else who hasn't spoken yet so far today who wants to say something? One person that's been really supportive for me is my psychology teacher. She's just always motivational in everything that she teaches and she understands that there's hardships that students go through and sometimes students fall asleep in class and they just have no motivation to do their work because of stuff going on at home. And she's really inspired me to do what I really want and not care about what other people think about it. She really relates to the students a lot and gets everyone interested in the work that they're doing and I feel like we need more programs that students are really passionate about like there's no culinary arts at my school or chorus and I think that students need to be exposed to that because how else will they find their passion. Anyone else want to talk about ideas they think would would encourage more students in the yellow shirt here? I came here as an ASL student at Highland High School and if it uh, weren't for Mrs. Um, Rebecca Haas, I wouldn't be here. Uh, she reached out to me and she touched me uh, when I didn't understand what was in the textbook, but I understand the concept, the tasks that need to be done. Um, uh, one time we were doing cream, uh, cream puff and it felt because my teammate wouldn't let me do anything. So I went home and I 
read the book, I followed the direction, I made the cream puff, puffs up, and the next day I came into class and gave it to her and my classmates, and I said, I show you! <laughs> so, so, so after that, they changed their behavior towards me somewhat, but she didn't interfere, but on the other hand, she advocated for me, saying that you dis discount this kid, but because she didn't say very much, doesn't mean she doesn't understand. And so that's just one caring um, um, teacher what makes me here today. Anyone else hasn't spoken yet? Go ahead, sir. I'm a volunteer in, with Santa Fe High School, and uh, this is new to me, and they've they had, they're finishing now their freshman program, and next year they'll have a freshman sophomore, and what it is, they call that Innovation Academy. And this is oriented toward kids who are interested in science, technology, engineering, and math. They do projects and where everything is integrated, as opposed to the traditional sitting in a classroom learning algebra, going over then taking a, I guess if you're a freshman, it's biology, and so on, that, that, that's integrated together. And so one of the projects they're planning uh, for the sophomores next year is a biosphere. So this will be a nine week thing. They'll make it a closed environment. Um, they have some things, they can only use things that don't have backbone, so like shrimp. You know, it's, it's an issue about animals. Uh, they have one about packaging, so it's a business oriented one. Um, robotics, that's always a biggie. I forget at the moment the fourth one, but that's the point is it's a new type of new application of project learning as a way to integrate things and to motivate kids to stay around and be more successful. So many creative ideas here from our audience. I want to just close very briefly with our panel. Anything you want to add about ways that you think we can help young people see a future for themselves, whatever that might be. There are so many different options for students, but see something that's positive for them, that's going to make them want to come into school or, or finish academically, get a GED, whatever they need to do to move on and achieve those goals for themselves. Tony. Closing thoughts. Um, I'd like to turn it on its head and say that uh, if you started with the passions of young people and the voice the, and built off the narrative of young people, you wouldn't design the schools that we currently have. You would have a much different kind of institution than we currently have in our communities. And if you started with their voice and designed backward from that, you'd have a completely different institution. And I think you would have people working in the institutions that are trained differently. You would have people that understand and know about adolescent development. They would understand the cognitive development of young people. They would understand the support structures needed to make young people feel safe in school. Those kinds of things are the, are the new thinking about school that we should be embracing as educators. Instead of asking young people to adapt to uh, structures that are 100 years old, haven't changed um, in the last century, we should be thinking about redesigning around the voice of the people who are served by those schools. Richard. I guess in my mind, it's, it's allow them to grow. As parents, sometimes we're so confining. As they get older, the more you can't come in. And we need to be emancipating, not subordinating. And, and I, I think that as we go, you know, and I know in our, in our native teachings, you know, we're, we're taught of those things that are inherent to us, our values, be good to one another, as the young man talked about, family. I don't think that's unique to natives, but love one another, be respectful to one another, be mindful. That's the real education, and those are the real nutrients because if you don't have that, you can have a PhD, you can have an MD, you can have a law degree, but if you're a jerk, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you need these pieces. I would like to applaud these young people for, for their attendance today. They've done a remarkable job in, in um, their speech and their courage to stand up and, and speak on TV. So good job, very good job. I would. I think the world is ever changing. A student that graduates today with average ability is already behind the eight ball because we've got, they've got competition from folks that have 
got all kinds of experience under the belt that are unemployed. They've got competition from students from, other, from others, from China, from India. And so we have to be on top of our game, our A game, each and every day when we stand in front of these kids. The children don't know what they don't know. So it's up to us to help them and guide them. With that said, we do need to listen to what interests them, what it's going to take to engage them, to have them uh, be proud to come to school and willing to come to school and just excited to come to school. And so I think it's gonna take a, a team effort all the way around. And the one thing I would like to say on behalf of public schools, we're the only in educational institution that will accept anybody and everybody. It doesn't matter about challenges, limitations. We will take anybody. And I'm proud to say that. And keep that in mind, students, because just because you come to school with certain challenges or limitations in your mind, that does not mean that you cannot succeed in being whatever you want to be. I can guarantee you that. Great note to end on there. Thank you all. And thank you to all of our guests today on the panel and in the audience for being part of this Rural Education Town Hall. Remember, every day matters. We invite you to continue this conversation. It's not over. Go to our website, NewMexicoPBS.org, to learn more about American Graduate and the Mission Graduate Initiative. I'm Sarah Gustavus at New Mexico PBS. On behalf of all of us, thank you for watching.